Good morning, everyone. Let me be the first to welcome you inside operating room number 21 here at Methodist Dallas Medical Center. My name is Ryan Owens. I'm the Director of Public Relations for the Health System. The other voice you will hear during this live feed is a voice that knows a whole lot more about what's going on inside of that operating room. We're fortunate to have the Chief of Neurosurgery here, Dr. Nimish Patel. Dr. Patel, thanks for for being with us today. This is really an extraordinary look for a lot of people, something they've never seen before. Absolutely, thank you and uh, appreciate everybody tuning in. And uh, as we walk you through the surgery, Dr. Patel will be here to tell us what has happened before we went live. We apologize, we're running a little late, about 20 minutes late. Dr. Patel, you know surgeries very often do run a little late, so that's not a big surprise. Can you help people who are watching understand what has happened in the hour and a half or two hours that our patient, Jenna, who we'll be talking a lot about, has been in the operating room? What's been going on? Thanks, Ryan. Let's take a look at this picture right in front of us. Right now, what we have is Jenna is uh, uh, obviously sleeping, and her head is turned with the left side up. And you have doctors uh, Graham and Dr. Mitchell operating on her brain currently as we speak. The reason for the delay is it's this is a, a coordinated effort between multiple uh, specialties. So we had to have anesthesiologists come in, we had to have the nursing staff come in, and we had to do it while she was awake. And so they had to prep, prepare her for all the things that are going on right now while she's been awake. Currently, Jenna is asleep. As they have now, what they did was they made a small incision on her uh, scalp and exposed the bone flap. And then they removed the bone flap from her brain uh, to just like a, a lid on a cookie jar. And so not to interrupt you, but just so that people can understand, we're seeing um, a drape and then just her face, right? So the surgeons are, are right behind that blue field there with her brain exposed, is that right? That's correct. Okay, and, and, and why um, they're able to do um, their work, they're obviously busy, but largely out of sight for us from the live feed. I think a lot of people will tune in, maybe hoping to see gross brains and all kinds of stuff like that. That's not going to happen, but tell us what we will see. We'll see Jenna's mouth and face, and we'll, we'll hear her before too long, right? Right. The goal here is, obviously, if we showed something gory, Facebook would cut us off, but what we're going to see is once they have exposed the brain, we're going to wake her up, and you'll see Jenna wake up, and then there's, you can see on top of the orange box there, there's an iPad. And the iPad has pictures, numbers, and the neurosurgeons, Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Uh, Graham back there, will stimulate parts of her brain, and Jenna will answer things on the iPad. And when they stimulate, what they're looking for are parts of the brain that are, are high, what we call high price real estate. Is it her speech center? Because those are the areas we want to avoid when we start the surgery. And let's take a step back here while the, while the doctors work in there and before Jenna wakes up and starts talking. And let's talk a little bit about Jenna. Her name is Jenna Shard. She's 25 years old, very young for something like this to happen. She remarkably was pursuing her master's in occupational therapy, helping stroke victims and those with other neurological problems. She was actually at a rehab hospital here in North Texas, a rehab center, when suddenly, Dr. Patel, she couldn't talk at all, and that's because of the placement of this lesion in, in her brain, right? Right. Uh, what a wonderful person. What a wonderful human being. She was basically finishing her occupational therapy rotation here in Dallas, and she started to have stroke-like symptoms. She couldn't talk, and uh, she was immediately rushed over to Methodist Dallas Emergency Room, where a picture of her brain was performed that showed a, a large bleed in the left side of her brain. And the great thing about us at this facility is we had to figure out what was causing that bleed. And so Dr. Uh, Mitchell was able to do some uh, very neat things by going up the blood vessels and being able to figure out what was the cause of this bleed. And with that, Dr. Graham and Dr. Mitchell were able to figure out that they, she has a, a bleeding area, a tangle of blood vessels that caused the bleeding or the stroke. And people are more familiar with a tumor. They think of a brain tumor. This is similar, but not exactly the same, and that's because it's made out of, uh, as you said, blood vessels, right? Yeah, it's a big tangle, a big ball of blood vessels. Think of a large mole barrier, if you can. And it's got to come out, correct? I mean, it's been bleeding, and that's been causing her seizures, and that explains her inability to speak. So this is not something that you would want to leave in someone's brain, right? Right. The whole reason for this is when Jenna doesn't have a history of seizures, 
and all of a sudden she had a new onset seizure. The problem was that the bleeding caused irritation to the brain, and when it caused irritation to the brain, the brain has a seizure, and she continued to have seizures. She was placed on medications, but the seizures were what we call refractory to that. The medications did not work, and so she has to have this removed. And we have to, it happens to be in an area where her speech is located. And that's the reason that the surgeons wanted to do this as an awake brain surgery. Can you explain to me the connection between what Jenna will be saying and the words that she'll be using and what that indicates to the surgeon about where to go and maybe more importantly where not to go in her brain to get this thing out? Ryan, I think you said it best already. Is Basically, we have a GPS tracking system for the brain already. And we need to find out where are the places that you want to avoid and where are the places that are safe to go because any small movements, a millimeter to the left or a millimeter to the right, can uh, uh, affect her speech. And so that's why we're going to do her awake because when, we're, when she's awake and we stimulate an area and if she's unable to speak during that time, we know that is a zone that we don't want to enter in trying to remove this lesion. And keep in mind the public relations guy is asking the questions here, and he's not a doctor, but is that a part of the brain, the upper or, or the mid-level of the left side that indicates things to you? Is that where all of us have our speech or all of us have some motor skills, or how does that work? Ninety-five percent of us, our language is located on the left, left side of our brain, and it's in the, what we call the temporal parietal area, so it's above our ear almost, if you want to think of it like that. And so, that, as you can see from the picture there, you can see her side of her face, and you can imagine where her ear would be and where the, uh, the doctors are going through right there to get a hold of the lesion. And because we've had a whole lot more people tune in since we started uh, this broadcast, I want to go back over and sort of reset for the people that joined us, because again, we did start a little bit late. First of all, the the most important person in that room is the woman that you see laying down there. She's an incredibly brave young woman, Jenna Shard, who agreed and actually was eager to have us broadcast this as part of an educational campaign to let people know that awake brain surgery is not some scary thing they saw in a B-movie a long time ago or on Grey's Anatomy or on ER, but that it's real and it's a real tool that helps surgeons do what they're going to do. And the two neurosurgeons who are in there working right now behind the, the blue sheets or drapings, for lack of a better term, it's Dr. Randall Graham and Dr. Bartley Mitchell. Here with me, helping us all understand what is happening, is our chief of neurosurgery, and that's Dr. Nimish Patel. He's the other voice you're hearing. I'm Ryan Owens. I'm the director of public relations for Methodists, and we're inside operating room number 21. We are waiting for Jenna, um, the anesthesiologist, to, to do what, Dr. Mitchell? Stop the, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Patel, stop the, the, the flow? So what we're looking at here, Ryan, is you can see that Jenna's face is covered. You can see that Dr. O may be asking her to wake up. She may she, be waking up. So we might be at the area right where we want to do is test her brain. Uh, right now, we have the skull is off. The brain is exposed, and both doctors Graham and Mitchell are stimulating areas of uh, area of what we call non-eloquent cortex, where we can approach and go into the brain safely. Now we're going to start to see a series of people get closer to Jenna and actually speak with her. Um, let's talk about that first of all. The anesthesiologist obviously has a very important role here, right? He is controlling whether or not she's awake or asleep. Yes, your anesthesiologist is the is the doctor that puts you to awake or asleep. And in this case, Dr. Oak, basically you have a tube put in your mouth when you go to sleep for any type of surgery. As you can see here, Jenna does not have a tube. Mm -hmm. she has, she's breathing freely. What she does have is that green thing you see underneath her nose is called a nasal cannula. Mm -hmm. And that nasal cannula allows her to breathe, but she's able to still talk. And what the delay was for us is we were making sure that we had her adequately asleep and we're able to then expose parts of the brain without her feeling any type of pain. And obviously we can't have a lot of cameras in the operating room because the last thing we want to do is distract Jenna who really needs to be focused on what's on the iPad and communicating that. You did see our photographer Ryan go and, and get a shot of the two doctors. Look Ryan, she's opening her eyes right now. Yeah, so. yes, she, she absolutely is. This is really something to watch. So right now what we're looking at is Jenna's waking up as you can see, there's an orange iPad on top of an orange box. 
Why don't we go ahead and bring up the microphone a little bit in the operating room so that you can hear. And Dr. Patel, you and I will just listen for a bit and let, let's hear them communicating with her. This process can take a little bit of time for her to wake up. She must be groggy. Was she was she fully under anesthesia, like 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 you would if you were having another surgery, right. or some some in between? Here she comes. Yeah, she was completely out, like she was in a dream state. And so imagine you just waking up from a normal day. How groggy she's had. She's having brain surgery. Today. You see her smiling. Yep, there she is smiling. And let's talk about the person that's on the iPad. This, this gentleman is named John. He's what's called a neuromonitor. Who are they and what do they do, Dr. Patel? So part of the team is a neuromonitor team. What they're doing right now is they're asking her questions. What do you see on the iPad? You're still waking up. You're waking up your... Okay, we're almost continuing. About half by three. Dr. Graham are testing the areas of the brain. Really that smile. Okay. Sorry to interrupt, Dr. Patel, but what a smile. No, it's a great smile. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. you so they will be um, showing her images on the iPad and then communicating with the surgeons based on the answers that she gives. Is that correct? That's right. Really well. and sometimes she won't be able to tell the answer based on what really you're well. stimulating. Nice close She's saying right now, I can see it very well. She's awake. Okay, irrigation. Okay. All right. She's shown literally pictures of a bird, a dog. She's asked a sentence, a number, things like that. If she makes a mistake or is unable to speak, that's obviously key information that needs to be told to the surgeon, right? That's right. The first thing we're doing is we'll stimulate a part of the brain and then ask her to do a task, which is review what's on, on the screen. And what the guys are doing, the neurosurgeons are doing, they're mapping out areas of her brain. They're putting little areas of the brain and making a map of where they can enter into the brain. All the extra sound there. Everything's wonderful so far. We're going to start testing your speech here pretty soon. Okay. And that's okay? Dr. Mitchell is actually explaining right. to her right now where in the process we are, that they're going to start mapping her brain and that everything is going well. She is yeah, awake, yeah. obviously, and communicating not only with the neuromonitors, but with her neurosurgeons, which is quite something to see. Right. You can see Dr. Oak there, the anesthesiologist, making sure she's breathing okay. Like my right eye is something clear, my left eye. I just have a hard time putting the eyes to me on the right now. Yeah, it's because we're giving you a little bit of medicine, just yeah, a little yeah. bit that gives you double vision sometimes. And Dr. Patel, while if we watch this extraordinary moment, moment okay. I hate to talk oh, over it, but we're getting so many questions about why is she having the surgery, who is this patient, so let's go over that again. Jenna Shard is her name, she's 25 years old, and Dr. Patel, what a story. She actually helps people with neurological problems when suddenly she had one. That's right. She is basically a, a wonderful human being who wanted to share her story because she believes that other people that may be struggling with this or have something like this know that, that there's a facility, there are uh, uh, surgeons who deal with this on a daily basis. And explain what she actually has in her brain that Dr. Graham and Dr. Mitchell are working to get out and why they need to get it out. We suspect that she has a, a, a tangle of blood vessels called a vascular malformation or a cavernoma. These things are notorious for, to cause in seizures, and that's what Jenna presented to when she presented to the emergency room was a, with a new onset seizure. We thought it was due to a stroke. However, it is a type of stroke, but it's due to a lesion, we call it here, or a massive uh, tangled blood vessels. And everyone, you're hearing a little zipping sound or a beeping sound that's coming from the iPad. The way this was explained to me by John, the neuromonitor that you see there, is that that gives them the surgeon time to, to, to what, Dr. Patel, you know, but, um, 
prod the brain, do something. Explain that to me. That's right. So the iPad will make a small uh, ding sound right. that allows the neurosurgeons to know, okay, it's ready to about to give a, a word or a number. At that, right after that ding sound, the surgeon will place uh, a probe on top of the okay. brain to stimulate it. If Jenna is able to say that whatever is on the iPad, then we know that is, a, that is an eloquent area, uh, that is a, a safe zone, excuse me. If she's not able to say it, we know that's a very uh, uh, unsafe area, that's a, a high price real estate. She just said butterfly. Okay. Hello. Hello. So all those right now Turtle. are safe zones. Okay. Turtle. 20. Bananas. And it sounds overly simplistic, Dr. Patel, but we're really waiting for her to miss something, right? Yeah. To make a mistake. That's the indication that that's a no-go zone. Great pickup, Ryan. That's exactly right. We want her to miss orange. orange. Then. And for those viewers that are asking Green. a lot of really good questions about the condition that she has, the lesion that she has, we would invite you to go back a little bit after this Nine. on our page. And there are a series of videos with Jenna that explain, and Dr. Graham and Dr. Mitchell explaining um, what's wrong with her and why they chose to do the surgery this way. She. It did look like uh, for a moment there, Dr. Patel, I know you can't hear quite as well sure. as I, I can, but that she did pause on one particular word um, and was unable to, to, to say what that was. So that's very important information for the neurosurgeon, right? That's right. That's, we're marking that on the brain okay. as a no-go zone. And typically, how long would this part of the surgery Fish. be, the, the, what you call mapping of the brain? The, well, the mapping, we're basically, we're going around. We are able to visually see where the lesion is, and we're mapping around that lesion to where we can enter. And that can take anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes. Two. And then once they have the path, and this is common sense, but once they have the path, then they will start the process of, of actually removing. Will Jenna be awake for all of that, some of that, or, or it depends? Now, it depends. Typically, what we do is once we map out the area of trajectory or where we want to move into, we put them back to sleep and remove the lesion. Sometimes we'll still keep them awake as we're moving, the, uh, as we're moving in. As the non-physician watching this, I can't help but ask you what I know everybody else is asking is, how in the world does this not hurt her? So uh, that is, I give credit to Dr. Oak, who has basically uh, have num has numbed her all the way around her skull, and he's able to be able to actually give her medications that uh, during the time she's awake as well. And I did not know this, but apparently there are not any or very few pain sensors on the brain itself, right? That so they can kind of do what they need to do without hurting her. Is that right? That's right. Your pain sensors are located in your scalp and then on the covering of the brain. And so, again, just to, to refresh for those who joined us, all of that part of the surgery, the removal of the piece of the skull, the exposing of the brain, obviously the numbing of all that before that, that happened before we started our live stream. And that is not a short process. Um, that was about an hour and a half to two hours of work on the part of all the, the entire team in there, the surgeons, the anesthesiologists, and everybody else. That's right. This is a team sport surgery. And as you see Jenna there continuing to answer these questions, the surgeon that you see just on the other side of the draping, that is Dr. Bartley Mitchell. Just outside of the view to the side of him is Dr. Randall Graham. And Dr. Patel, it may be worth talking about these two as a team, why they're doing it together and why they work together as well as they do. You know them both very well. Right, both of these guys, I'm privileged to work with both of them. They are uh, subject matter experts when it comes to this field. I mean, these guys are, 
they were trained. They came out of training programs. There you get are, a look at both of them now. Yeah, they came out of training programs that were top ten in the country. They chose to come to Methodist. They they believe in serving in a purpose higher than themselves. These are just good guys, and they're we're all cut from the same cloth and have the same beliefs. And doing this surgery is basically surgical choreography. It's like an art in doing a dance. And we've trained to get, we've worked together so much that we're able to feed off each other without even saying anything. And these two guys are second to none. And so you see Dr. Mitchell in particular in this shot, obviously looking over towards the neuromonitor, uh, John, to actually get, make sure that they're figuring out exactly when she misses a word. It sounds like for the most part, at least to the person that doesn't really know what he's listening to in all candor, that she's hitting most of these points. She seems to be recognizing most of these things. Is that a surprise? Is that is that good? Is that bad? No, that, that's actually a good thing for us, for those of us who are about to enter into the brain. So it gives us a, a lot of leeway of where we can access the lesion. And there you saw John, the, the neuromonitor. He's giving a thumbs up when she gets the correct answer. And mm -hmm. once again, each one of these answers matters very much and John was actually at Jenna's home in Allen yesterday doing a baseline test where they ran through this so they would know exactly how she normally answers and he did that again in pre-op just before surgery. The baseline is important for all of this, right Dr. Patel? It's, it's like going in and playing a game. You have to visualize what you're about to go through and for this, for Jenna to have the courage and the strength and to, and to be willing to yeah. share it her preparation was key. And so anytime we do awake craniotomies, we always do a, uh, a review beforehand. And as I was doing research for this, this live stream, the decision to do it awake or asleep really is all about the patient, right? Can that's you talk right. a little bit about that? You've got to have somebody that's A, comfortable with this okay. and knows what's going on and, and doesn't frankly freak out by being in an operating room awake. Yeah, there's a lot of things. And just look at her. I'm, I'm so impressed how she's handling this. Um, it, we go through a whole battery of tests, personality-wise, how they're able to uh, handle stressful situations, are they motivated themselves. And clinically speaking, we also want to know where the lesion is, and we want to avoid that high-priced real estate. You, you heard that, Ryan? So I did. So that's, that's a clue to Dr. Graham and Dr. Mitchell. All right, stimulate. 12. I'm so impressed by her. She is a very, very impressive young woman. We should say just for people who are joining in a little bit late that that zipping sound that you continue to hear, the zipping, is from the iPad. It's not a piece of surgical equipment, but I, I know to, to the outside the ear that could sound a little um, ominous. It's certainly not. Vision. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's One of the uh, questions we're getting a lot online, Dr. Patel, is can she move anything else or is this just the ability to move her mouth? Talk okay. about that. No, great question. Yes, she can move anything. If she wanted to move her legs, she can move her legs, she can move her arms. This requires right. discipline on her part and to be able to listen to the directions it, while she's having the brain surgery done. So, so much of this is, um, is based on the patient. Elephant. Strawberry. Mm -hmm. Strawberry. Butterfly. Mm -hmm. Butterfly again. So we hear they're going through the similar sequence, right? Mm -hmm. You, you want to do this a couple of times, right? But they're mapping different areas of the brain again. If you're surrounding an area, they're going to go through that same sequence over and over to make sure that they have uh, everything that they expect to uh, go through. 20. Bananas. Two. Nine. 
And Dr. Patel, let's re reset one more time no. for people. I can only imagine if this popped up on your Facebook feed out of nowhere and you couldn't quite tell what was going on. My name is Ryan Jeez. Owens. I'm the Director of Public Relations for Methodist Health System here in North Texas. Um, it's my honor to be joined with by our Chief Sorry. of Neurosurgery, Dr. Nimish Patel here at Methodist Dallas. You are looking at Jenna Shard. She's a 25-year-old woman undergoing awake brain surgery to remove a mass of blood vessels that's in her brain. You don't see them right now, but you will later, and you have before the two neurosurgeons behind that draping, Dr. Randall Graham and Dr. Bartley Mitchell. Dr. Patel, for those who are just tuning in, explain what is happening right now. What's with okay. her keeping saying the same words over and over again? What is that about? So what we're looking at here is you see a picture, uh, uh, actual live feed of Jenna, and you see that she is facing towards us with the left side up. The doctors are working behind her ear. What they have done at this point in time, they have made an incision in her scalp. They have removed a big bone flap, and they've opened the covering of the brain. And as we speak right now, they are stimulating parts of her brain to find a safe zone of entry. You can see from the corner there, there's an orange iPad up above the orange box. They're asking her words, they're stimulating, and to see if, how she responds. Okay. She's doing a fantastic job. This is simply amazing, yeah. <laughs> amazing to watch, and how calm and she, cool yeah. and, and uh, the two neurosurgeons told me Jenna was completely on board with this and completely invested right. in this, and well, you can tell it right now. Yeah, it, it is based on the patient completely. She was prepped yesterday. Cool. The monitoring crew went there yesterday, went through what the words would be and how the sequence of events would go, but all this is based on Jenna. She can move any of her arms and her legs if she wanted to, but we talked about not doing that before, uh, before the surgery to make sure she oh. follows through, and we can proceed with this to remove the lesion in a safe manner. And as she continues to go through the same words over and over again, maybe you can explain to folks, Dr. Patel, that her head is actually in, I don't know if clamp is the right word, but there, there are a lot of positioning and, and pre-work that went into this before she woke up and started talking, right? Right. That, what you can't see under the blue draping is that she's laying on her side. And with what we see with her ears up and what is holding her head is she's basically free-floating except a clamp is basically pinching the front of her forehead and the back of her head, and that's holding her up. And Dr. Patel, what most people would think of as the what surgery, surgery part, the actual removal of this mass of, uh, of blood vessels, that really hasn't right. started yet, right? This is still the mapping process. And once she is done going through the sequence of words, right. that's when the surgeons will know exactly the path to take to get that lesion out. That's right. And they may keep her awake as she's as they're removing the lesion, and I can't see it yet. But what I will say is I want to point out you look at Dr. Graham and look at Dr. Mitchell's glasses. They have specialized glasses called loops. What it allows them to do is mag have magnified appearance of the blood vessels and areas of the brain while they're taking out the lesion. And is that a, is that a light, as simple as a light on the front of their, um, or is that something else? No, that is exactly right. Both, both of them have a high-powered light in order to have more light than a typical room would give. And describe for us the mapping process are they what are they doing on the surface of the brain are they leaving little markers are they what, what, how does how does something like that work maybe if we get a pan to the, uh, the gps system that shows us where the lesion is there's a map yeah. on we already know where the lesion is and what they're doing is we just don't we know physically where it is we just don't know exactly what parts yeah. of the brain are eloquent or high priced real estate and what they're doing now is they're stimulating and if Jenna says it's okay, what they do is put a piece of paper of that is a safe zone. And so they make all these small little areas there with pieces of paper of go uh, with green or red, or everybody has their own different technique of where they can go, and then they'll approach the lesion through the safe zone. I'm sorry, Dr. Patel, did you say actually they put pieces of little paper on the brain? Well, 
Yes, there'd be actually the sterile paper. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, but but yeah. but that's that's how they do it. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Is anything bothering you at all? Just a couple areas of minor spots. And then the double vision. Yeah. I've, I've got a little swab for you. I can give you something to, to rinse out your mouth just a little bit, okay? Oh, yeah. And they're constantly yeah, asking Jenna how she's doing. Is she comfortable? She just said, I think her mouth was a little dry. We're able to map everything out. We've got a really uh, good view of everything. And a swab of water. She says she's dry. may do it while she's awake. He said for the first part at least they would do that. Um, and you see her smiling and it's just so remarkable to hear the neurosurgeons. We should say that both of these two men that are the, these neurosurgeons in addition to being so talented are, are wonderful guys. So it's nice to see them communicating with a patient like this. And I know that she feels so comfortable with them. 16, 17, 18, 19, 1. Give me a smile. Still there. Doing pretty well so far. Okay. Good. So, how much more school do you have? Um. Done, right? Yeah. So it's supposed to be done in December. Okay. But I'll be doing my field work till January. Okay. Be walking in December then. They're trying to see if I'll be able to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm hoping so. Yeah. I am hunting that Wednesday. Um, they're trying to see if they'll make an exception to let me walk. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to walk with my class, so, yeah. Where do you go to school now? Um, it's called Bernal University. It's in Gainesville, Georgia. Okay. I just went there for Oh, really? Okay. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I love that place. Did you go there for the whole two and a half years ago. Yeah. So it's perfect because it's right by, it's an hour from the mountains, one hour from the city. Yeah. It's a good location. Traffic there is crazy though. I know. Well, more than here though. <laughs> so I feel here. It's bad here too. Yeah. yeah, the traffic here. It's hard. Yeah. Not really, but... It's just nice and close. Right. Yeah. And yeah, it's not too much to do. Anymore. And so, Dr. Patel, yeah. she is now really having a remarkably yeah. casual, yeah. if you could say that, uh, under the circumstances, conversation yeah. with yeah. John, yeah. Oh, who is yeah. the uh, yeah. the neuromonitor. And this is really just to keep her relaxed while they begin to work on a path to remove this this lesion, correct? Right. They're probably in the process right now of removing the lesion oh, yeah. and listening to her as well. And he's basically distracting her to make sure that there, she stays relaxed, as you mentioned. And so we're we're done with the iPad, at least for now. They, they, know, they seem to know where they're going. And this... This is more, Dr. Mitchell had said before that um, that sometimes he would have people maybe FaceTime with someone they know to relax, but this is just uh, more so that they can get their work done now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so I actually am from Illinois, so um, I went to my undergrad at North Central College in Naples. Okay. 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 Nice area. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay. All right, Jenna, we're about to get started, okay? Okay, great. And that was an announcement from Dr. Graham that they are about to get started with the removal of this lesion, this mass of blood vessels inside of young Jenna's brain, all while she is awake. So typically these brain surgeries can be done while the patient is asleep. In Jenna's case, because the, the we'll call it a lesion, because this tangle of blood vessels is located next to, uh, right in her speech area, we wanted to make sure we keep her speech area preserved as best as possible. And so that's why we do what's called awake mapping. And what we're doing now, what the guys have done so far, the neurosurgeons, have figured out a safe zone. And the only way to do that is basically test what parts of her speech are affected so while she's awake, while they're stimulated, it, and once they, they've now accomplished that, and now they're entering into the brain. Yeah. She's very active. She's asking John questions. Where is he from? You live in Houston. Tell me that. Yeah. Um, so she is perfectly lucid at this point. That's right. Completely wide awake. I bet she could text if, if we allowed her. Uh, she could get on Facebook right now, watch her maybe her own surgery. Um, she, yeah, she's completely awake. This is a great job from Dr. Oak. And Dr. Patel, how long might it take them to, to actually remove that? I, I know obviously it depends on where it is and how big it is and everything else, but in general, is this a relatively quick part of the surgery and then she'll go back to sleep, or how would you assess that? In her case, based off the images that we saw preoperatively or before the surgery, it looks like it is close to the surface. So if you have to dig out something and it's closer to the surface, it takes less time. I would assume just a, it would take maybe about 30 minutes to an hour once we're into the brain, if that long. And we're, we're going to end our broadcast here in a few minutes, but we'll stay and listen to Jenna a little bit longer. But after um, we go off the air, for lack of a better term, there's still a lot of work to be done, right? What will happen uh, after that, Dr. Patel? So then what we'll do is, We'll make sure there's no other bleeding areas within the brain. And then they'll close the brain. They'll put the covering back on and then put the bone flap back on. And when they put the bone flap back on, they'll fasten it with titanium metal fasteners. And then they'll sew the skin back together. And they'll take the clamp off. And then she'll be ready to be waking up. And what, what's typically the recovery time from this type of surgery, whether awake or asleep? So if it's asleep, yes. you have to recover from the anesthesia. And the anesthesia, because you've been asleep, and you have to take the tube out of the mouth. And so recovery like this takes about, uh, in the hospital, it takes about a day or so. Uh, in her case, I'd probably say about the same. But she's been awake, so I think it may be even less than that. So she can expect to spend a couple of nights here at Methodist Dallas, or yeah. at least one? Well, at least make sure. She'll go to the intensive care unit tonight because, after all, she did have brain surgery. <laughs> so we do want to make sure that she doesn't have any type of bleeding or seizures or anything funny right after the surgery. We'll make sure that she's good for a day or so. And the way she's moving along, it'll probably be a day or two days at the most. And then she'll go to what's called step-down status. We'll make sure she's eating okay, walking okay. So all in all, to be actually more conservative, probably about three days, four days. And we're hearing some noises. It sounds like suction to me. You probably have a better handle on what, what they might be doing. Is that likely what that sound is? Yes, the pitch sounds like that of a suction. So, You know, when you hear that sound in the operating room, it makes you a little bit nervous. But the, su the, the suction is what? What's the purpose of that? Suction is to make sure that the field is clear. So the, the neurosurgeons, Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Graham, are looking at the brain. They are resecting now. I bet what they're taking is the lesion or the tangled vessels and they're using the suction to, in order to remove any blood clot around that lesion. That's fine. Yeah, she's, she's my baby. I got her in Georgia. They're strategically doing, moving the suction. So there are nice. little valves on the suction. They can put their thumbs on where the suction is much greater or where it's softer. Yeah, and so they're good. manipulating multiple things as they enter into the brain. Jenna is now talking about her dog, Paisley, who I met and who she would very much want to get as much attention as possible. She's telling John, the neuromonitor, about her dog. And she's just like, easy to talk That's cool. You'd be surprised. Some of the things that people remember are animals, pets. They find a very uh, eloquent area of the brain and they're stored there. And people can lose their memories but as they get uh, after an injury. But one of the things they will always remember is their pet's names. 
and she's very comfortable talking about Paisley. I can attest to that, whether yeah. she's in surgery or not. She's very proud of her dog, so that's smart for John to be talking to her about that kind of thing. Thanks, Okay. Look at that great smile. What a wonderful patient. What a motivated patient. You know, at Moody Brain Spine, we struggled with the idea of doing a Facebook Live brain surgery. But, um, but because Jenna was so forthcoming and she wanted to show the, the rest of the community that, you know, if you, if you have this problem, you can, you can help fix it. So she was basically a role model for us, and we supported her because of that. And one of the things she said to me when we first approached her about doing this is that she thought people had so many misconceptions about brain surgery. They've watched way too much TV, too many bad movies, and that by showing people this, um, it would not only educate them, but raise awareness about just how far medicine has come and what we are now able to do literally while the patient is up and talking. And I would say mission accomplished. Absolutely. Absolutely. As you listen to Jenna talk, you may hear a little accent, especially if you're from Texas, and you might think she doesn't sound like she's from around here, and you're right. She's actually from uh, northern Illinois, about two hours west of Chicago, a community called Freeport, and I know there are a lot of people in that town who are watching this, and a lot of people who have been spreading the message about Jenna and this surgery in that community. It seems like a very close-knit place, and so we want to give them a little shout-out here, as I know many, many hundreds of them are watching this right now. Jenna is, well, you can see for yourself, she's doing quite well. She's a rock star. I have no idea, but I'm going to the same place, you know? And I can't tell them, but I want to be like, and they're con like, talking with me, I want to be like, I understand, you know? You can see also the monitor up the side there, it says 200. That's the IV fluids yeah. and things like that. Exactly. Medication is going at it's certain rates to keep her uh, from having any pain. Therapy, yeah, and then the patient. And I mean, Dr. Patel, this sounds like an overly simplistic question, and it probably is, but the fact that they are removing this thing right now and we are hearing her talk just like she did yesterday, this is all good, right? This is all perfect. This is fantastic. The fact that, that she is just able to have a general conversation with us. You can see Dr. Oak here. She's getting a little dry mouth. So he's giving her a sponge with water on it to wet her mouth. Anybody who's ever come out of anesthesia, that's a familiar feeling. That's right. That's right. You can see that she has something in her nose as well. That's how she's getting oxygen. Or, uh, she's getting oxygen by speaking like we normally would, but we're also supplementing the oxygen through her nose through what's called a nasal cannula. And you can see that um, in the general public. Typically, when people have surgery, as you all know, they get intubated. Intubated means they have a tube put into their mouth. I know. Oh my gosh, it's so hot. Brian, I also want to point out, look at her though. forehead. You see a big metal round thing there. I do. Yeah, that is, we have clamped her head in order to keep it still during the surgery. So this allows us to have a, a very accurate position in where we're going to go to take out the lesion. Jenna is smiling. She's laughing. This can't be overly comfortable for her, can it? I mean, a head in a clamp is no day at the beach, right? Yeah, not just the head in the clamp, her whole body. She can move it any time if she wants to. Now, she's laying on her side. Because she's laying on her side, her arm could be feeling numb. Her legs could be tired. She could move about. But this requires her to have at least sound of mind of not moving the rest of her limbs. Her shoulder, you can see that's her shoulder that she's laying on, her right shoulder. Well, I think we're going to, to wrap up our live feed now. We've been here on for about 45 minutes, and I think we've given many thousands of people a nice taste of what was going on today inside operating room number 21 here at Methodist Dallas Medical Center. From this point, Jenna will, in the near future, go be put back to sleep. They will put her skull 
the piece of the, sc the skull that has been removed back on her head, and then she will be here at the hospital for a couple of days, perhaps, to recover. But Dr. Patel, again, all signs at this point are that this could not have gone better. This, this has been close to perfection, yes. And I want to thank you for uh, being here to Absolutely. walk me through this, Dr. Nimish Patel, our chief of neurosurgery, who is an invaluable voice, quite literally, during this broadcast. We obviously want to thank 25-year-old Jenna Shard as she smiles in the operating room for being willing to do this, for being willing to educate the public. We also, of course, want to thank the uh, two men with ice running through their veins right That's now. That's right. Our two, two neurosurgeons, Dr. Randall Graham and Dr. Bartley Mitchell, who have done a phenomenal job and are something special to even let us do this. Finally, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I'm Ryan Owens, the Director of Public Relations for Methodist Health System. Stay here on the Facebook page throughout the day and we'll have updates from the neurosurgeons once they're all done and an update on just how Jenna is doing. Thank you all very much. We certainly hope you've learned a lot. We have.